Hello, everyone, and welcome back to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by Patriot Patch, company of Easy Grips, MAF Corporation, and FFL Payments. This show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Matthew Rosier, and I'm joined by, who could it be now, but a rep? It's me. I'm coming to you live from the mean streets of Battlefield Duties, hit map Rust. Yeah, that's uh, D.E. Rust, right? Yeah. D- that's a that's a really good one how are you doing today i'm doing okay it's been a, a little bit of a long day and then a little bit of a while since we did an episode so there's a bunch of stories and some good things have happened and some less than severely less than good things have happened so yeah no that that is a hundred percent true and so without further ado let's get straight into one of those severely less good things so to start with let's talk about the super safety fiasco. Uh, and to understand this, we got to kind of take a step back and talk about, well, what is the super safety? So there's a character called Hoffman, Hoffman Tactical in the 3D printing space. And he's a really nice guy, um, makes all of his own clothes, doesn't wear shoes, you know, like a totally normal human being. Uh, he's come out with some pretty cool stuff. And he did, you know, after the whole FRT thing happened, he came out with his own design, which it's a safety. He calls the super safety. And it's basically, you know, imagine a normal AR safety that's got a hook coming off of it. And effectively, when the bolt carrier comes forward, it boops your finger, uh, you know, basically boops your finger off the trigger. And uh, so I think it's it's important for us to, like, go in a straight line here, right? This guy... Hoffman comes out with this thing called a super safety. Describe it how you will. It works kind of like an FRT, or right? In in so many words, it turns the safety on and off as the bolt is going, winds up working kind of like an FRT. He puts out this video, right? And this is where Ivan and I agree that he kind of, that, you know, we don't agree with what he did here, where he very confidently says, this is not, uh, this is not a machine gun. I talked to a bunch of people, right? Uh, it's good to go. Doesn't disclose who he talked to, what they said, or, or like what the determining factors were in that advice. Just kind of says it. It, ca- it is- caused a lot of it caused a lot of people all across the internet and printing community and, and broader broader gun community even to run under the assumption that like when FRTs came out, you know, the guys put out a video that said these are totally legal. We 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 asked a couple of guys and they said for sure, dude, that's totally legal. Right. And then they sold a ton of them, and then the ATF started knocking on people's doors saying. Mm, you shouldn't have that. We don't think that you should have that. Where you know they didn't, you know, th- of course, you know, n- none of these entities ask the ATF themselves because if you ask the ATF themselves, their answer is going to be no, you can't have it because that's that's how, especially this current ATF operates. Hoffman comes out with this thing called the Super Safety. The twin brothers start selling the devices. Right, so Hoffman just kind of put the file out. You can make it. You can do whatever you want. Um, twin Bros start selling it. And now, Twin Bros gets raided. Uh, And so when it happened, people were acting all confused. They were like, what could this possibly be about, right, Evan? Yep. And so Twin Bros sold two products, more or less throughout their lifetime. One was this uh, Super Safety, and the other one was sort of like an open bolt fire control group for a Mac, but... That, you know, that that on its own wouldn't rise to the level of being a machine gun. And a lot of people were hypothesizing, well, it was clearly these these triggers for Max that, that that they got in trouble for. But then, of course, you know, a representative of Twin Bros took to Twitter to clarify it was specifically the super safeties that they were rated over and these uh, Mac triggers weren't weren't a problem. And of course, these Mac triggers are very analogous to like Colt Colt the Colt LMG used an open bolt fire control group. So wait, hold Mac- on. You you're saying Mac triggers. This is the product that was called the Pepper Jack. Correct. And it's an AR fire control group, right? That, along with some modifications to your bolt carrier, makes it open bolt full auto, right? Right. Yeah. So, again, in the early days, people were saying, "Oh, it wasn't the super safety because the super safeties are all legal." It was this pepper jack, but it's very clear that no, this was about the super safety. Yes. And so, let me say this clearly: I think that there's a line of what, of, and the only line right is what is illegal, and I think this is on the legal side. Right. And that should be the only thing that matters. Um, Of course, ATF likes to pretend that there aren't any lines. There are just vast miasmas. 
And if you're anywhere near the miasma, they can grab you and lock you in a cage. <laughs> They're the only ones that can divine what this miasma reads on this given day. Yeah, and where you are relative to it. So, I mean, Hoffman never really directly sold the super safety thing. Correct. He he, he sort of like designed it and then put the design out there. And then right. I guess the, the only thing that I would like want to fault him with, I guess, is he made a video where he said like, oh, this is definitely not a machine gun and didn't really disclaim the fact that i mean i i, I don't want to mince my words here right if anybody looked at this and said and if anybody looked at this and came to any sort of conclusion that was something like oh the atf would totally be okay with you having this they're an idiot uh atf made their position on frts pretty clear mm -hmm. yeah and, and this was after that happened and so it was this, yeah this that, isn't, this isn't functionally and you in, in terms of how it works on the inside it is different Instead of adding a sear like the FRT does, it changes the safety into a sort of a sear. But in terms of like, right. you know, in terms of the ends in itself, it works just like an FRT. And the ATF well, let me pull is up a, a picture of it. The ATF has taken the position of uh, the super. You know, the FRTs being bad, and the FRTs aren't substantially different in that regard. All right, so here's a. Uh... And this, it's funny because this picture doesn't really even make it any clearer, but there's the device, right? Uh, it's got kind of a tail, and the way all the geometry on this works out, as the bolt carrier comes forward, your finger gets booped. Yeah, the, right. the bolt coming back kicks the trigger, kicks the safety on, which kicks the trigger forward, and then the bolt coming forward kicks the safety off, and you can pull the trigger again. Right. And yeah, so... And it, it, yeah. In that regard, you know, in, in that explanation, it is much like an FRT. And you know, ATF, ATF has taken the position, I think their official position is, some FRT devices are machine guns. The right. reason that they said some, and you know, a lot of people speculated early on, why would they say some? I don't know that I, I don't know that I, we, may, we may not have spelled it out on the show, but the reason they'd say some is because the ATF is anticipating the Fifth Circuit would apply, you know, the, the Fifth Circuit would apply their logic behind bump stocks to FRTs. Right. If the Fifth Circuit says some, you know, the, the, the ATF understands this injunction will come down based on the manufacturers that end up suing over it. When this injunction says, oh, these manufacturers' devices don't meet the statutory definition of machine, of machine gun, uh, the ATF can go right on after any other FRT because their letter right. said some. So they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, well, the ones that that weren't were the ones that the injunction applies to everything else is a completely illegal machine gun according right. to us yeah and, and i wonder which ones you know how it'll shake out in terms of market popularity uh right that that definitely won't be a factor on which ones wind up intentionally on or off the injunction right um, and I know, I know i know a lot of people were were you know saying well isn't there an injunction against this isn't you know, isn't this already covered well no the injunction that exists in the fifth circuit is extremely narrow and that it applies to uh, the manufacturer's customers right and it applies to the members of the national association for gun rights and it only applies to devices that uh, rare breed sold or the wide open triggers that rare breed sold so right. it only applies to a very you know slim number of devices and as far as i understand it like they tried to say it's a nationwide injunction but then you've got a different circuit court that's already came to a different opinion right so it's it's one of those things where yeah maybe you wouldn't get in big trouble for having it but then it's not one of those things that you probably want to advertise you have i think the the problem this this poses right is when we're winning we don't want to like try to do a victory lap before the victory right i feel like and I, i'm really trying to be careful with my words because people are going to accuse me of like being unsupportive or whatever like no i'm one of the only lawyers that have actively gone against the nfa like you guys can send the money to whatever three letter groups you want they haven't actually filed suits directly challenging the constitutionality of these provisions I don't believe in the NFA. I don't believe it's constitutional. I think it's total bullshit. That said, there are there's certain things that I think are helpful. And then when you're kind of like trying to own the libs while we're still gaining ground, I just don't... Okay, this is hard, right? Because on the one hand, mass noncompliance is awesome, right? It's yep. hilarious to see. Love it. 
And frankly, I loved seeing all the videos of people shooting their super safeties all over the place. On the other hand, when I was seeing that, I was thinking, wow, this is going to make my job harder. <laughs> I mean, do you, like, what do you do? You there's, go, there's going to be people who who end up getting in trouble. And of course, we I, we, we had discussed this early on that they're going to hit somebody who's selling them first. And then probably, you know, probably especially this around this being an election year, uh, if they're really looking for a win, they'll go after somebody, you know, again, YouTube high profile that's been posting these things and they'll make an example out of them because you know, no, nothing, you know, nothing hits their headlines better than, oh, look, the ATF is competent. You know, it makes them look competent whenever they're like, oh, we stopped guys selling these machine gun conversion devices. Right. And you'll be able to go to all your little forums and type out, oh, no, it's totally not. It's totally not because function trigger, single function trigger automatic. Uh. The, the people that the ATF are trying to convince that the ATF is awesome won't read your forum post. They'll just go with, oh, these are all illegal, bad, awful things. Yeah. You saw even a little bit of this. You know, we've got a separate story on this, but the, you know, the bump stock oral arguments. FRTs were brought up at least three times because mm -hmm. you know, they were talking about the fact that like, well, if you if you guys chop down bump stocks, then devices that are better than bump stocks would be legal too by this reasoning. And you know, again, I'm not saying that the FRT thing shouldn't have happened, but it you know, it makes you know it, make, it makes the justice's job harder if they're going to try and say bump stocks are okay because right. now they realize like you know th th they're going to have to be conscious of the fact that they're that they're like really breaking an egg to make this omelet they're breaking a lot of eggs to make this omelet right yeah uh, so we, yeah we will talk about that in just a second um but yeah so let's take a look at this the tweet here this was from twin bros uh, it has been brought to our attention that the super safety are now deemed machine gun devices per ATF. The raid on Twin Bros LLC was over the super safeties and not for the pepper jacks. We're no longer allowed to sell super safety kits. We are sorry about all of the unfulfilled orders and we'll be refunding everyone who placed orders on those items. Um, and then you were being a good sport, you know, and uh, they said they'll post all the information and documents once they become available. And then we had people responding by <laughs> uh, posting that they were donating to the gun rights groups that I'm sure know what's going on here and will totally do something. Of course. Uh, yeah, It's in your hands now, three letter group. Like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we're going to keep and, uh, the same lawsuit in the fifth circuit. This um, is the sort of situation that we had, we had talked about where it it's, it's like the worst sort of feeling whenever you, like you and I are both the kind of person where we enjoy we enjoy being proven right, but this is really a situation where we didn't want to be proven. I right. wanted to be wrong, right? Because right. I mean, the first thing I said was, "This is not a machine gun," but I wouldn't fuck with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like just because I know what they're doing right now. Um, one of our friends, Seattle, <laughs> and I gotta pull this up. One of our friends was a lot less upset about being proven. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can see uh, RK Spookware, who got like really dumped on. Um, uh, right, he, like here's the Hoffman post: the Super Safety's been released. YouTube premiere at noon today. To which RK Spookware replied: Interesting design, but I'm not going to be donating to anyone's legally fees. <laughs> to which Hoffman replied: You'll be donating to mine, which was weird. <laughs> why did not, he say that i'm not sure what he's saying there but okay yeah and then now rk will i though <laughs> oh man no I'm, I'm looking for the the one yeah the rk was right jar right <laughs> you yeah, know he he did a big lap yeah, who could have seen this coming um but here's the other interesting thing that i want to touch on and i, I do I, I feel horrible for twin bros because like look i had direct involvement with a lot of law enforcement in this arena it's fucking horrible like you you guy unless you've been through it trust me you have no idea just how fucking terrible this is like it is truly at all times you feel that your life could just be ripped away from you at any moment so let's not dunk on them too hard right this is a terrible terrible thing and why are they going through it well because they were trying to help people have fun in a creative interpretation of the law right like that's not a reason to lock somebody in a cage or take away all of someone's shit, right? Um, all that said, there's a couple other sticking points that are really weird here. And it was that Hoffman just kind of gave everything away, right? Like he he is it's very clear that Hoffman is desperate to become a you know traditional gun influencer and 
you know what? I, I hope he gets that, right? Like, God bless him. But the twin bros, they kind of just appeared out of nowhere, right? And yep. like claimed to have a patent pending on the freely posted Hoffman design. Of course, that was a that was a silly thing because if if depending on how deep into FRT lore you are, you'll you'll know that the technology actually dates back a long way before FRTs were a thing. Right, and it has to do with this guy Thomas Allen Graves who like patented. Three, like he got three different patents for the same way a trigger would work and then sold one of them to the guys who eventually sold them to the guys who eventually became rare breed ta- you know, rare breed triggers right. and then thomas allen graves sued rare breed triggers lost yeah. uh maybe he didn't sue them he just threatened them and then rare breed something triggers- weird happened and where there's another like sub company that, that was called graves llc or something right like that. that was the that was this thomas allen graves yeah. guy but it essentially is but like it's not clear nightmare. whether that was directly him or not it, right. uh, it, 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 yeah. it's a little bit of a legal nightmare but this right. thomas allen graves guy came after twin brothers for patent violation despite the fact that uh, yeah. you don't have to be a patent attorney to realize that none of his three patents concerning this describes right. what the super safety does right. but uh he, you know he, he came after twin bros and twin bros like freaked out and went straight to like 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 google google on the internet for a uh, patent right. lawyer how do i save this and the patent lawyer was like you should file for a provisional patent for your own thing and they were like okay we'll do that and it's like that's uh, retarded <laughs> that's not, <laughs> not how that works <laughs> it's like a hundred thousand percent not how that works and so they <laughs> they ended up they ended up dropping that once they got yeah. better advice but right you know, but also it, they realized I, go ahead i guess just the point is that just how disjointed and retarded everything <laughs> Yes, as it was happening, and so like no one has any idea what's going on with Hoffman at that point, at this point, right? And so like here's the interesting thing: um, what's the liability for Hoffman? Uh, it's actually not as clear cut as you might think. There is, you know, aside like I don't want to get into the ITAR thing, right? Because I don't, I ultimately don't think that that'll ever carry the day when it comes to an individual. No. Uh, you know, I just I don't think that anyone with a breathing lawyer will be able to get locked up on an ITAR charge for something like this. That said, the the one thing that really is a sticker here is in his little vi- video where he's out in the field, he just just straight up says that he like he's like, yeah, you can print these in plastic and they last like you know twenty rounds or whatever. So I had this one metal three D printed in China. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the and that's where i want to get to kind of the uh i think the the underlying lesson here that we can learn from a lot of what's been going on in the gun space is that if you are going to flirt with the law i'm not going to say break the law because i still i don't think anyone here was breaking the law but it becomes a lot easier to survive flirting with the law if you don't post it on youtube and if if you like minimize the 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 the, the overview of three letter agencies involved with your law flirting, yeah. because <laughs> importing a th- importing a a device right. for your airsoft gun is presumptively legal. If it's for an actual gun, it is not legal any longer. Yeah. Especially if this device is something that I don't know a different three letter agency may consider to be or to not to be. A machine gun conversion device yeah which fits under the three letter law uh <laughs> so it's it's kind of like it's it's it, it reminds me of the the meme you made where it was uh you know gun tubers when they haven't posted an illegally imported machine guns in five minutes <laughs> uh, i and the, the reason i'm saying this is because i love you guys stop stop it stop posting live freely and don't post <laughs> that. I mean, shit post, right? Or at the very least, be be fully informed before you make that decision. We we would right. appreciate if you would be fully informed. In and, and I, like I saw some people saying like, oh, Hoff, you know, Hoffman owns this. Hoffman's going to get all these people arrested. I don't think that's true. I think he could have done a better job of conveying to people the potential risks that they may be taking on. But this this isn't his fault. Uh, right. The, the blame squarely li- li- lays in the hands of the schizophrenic overlords to which we are subject. Yeah. Yeah. The high functioning alcoholic 30 <laughs> somethings that, that sit at the cores of all these agencies. Uh, it's terrifying, but, but yeah, like guys, you can't 
you can't depend on a company. You can't depend on an influencer to tell you what is and is not legal. Like you can say that all day. You can point to the video, but that doesn't mean a damn thing in, in court. Yeah, the um, joke we are making is, uh, your honor, there's videos on YouTube of it. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> but your honor, everyone was doing it. Right. Uh, that, sh- that, that, that could work in some contexts, but it's uh, you know that that's not where what you want your defense to be. Uh, so it's a cautionary tale, I think. Um, thank God no one's been arrested yet. Um, let's hope it just stays at stays right where it's at, right where it's just like a flex of the muscles. Because ATF does this a lot, where they're like, "Stop it, <clears throat> stop," right, <laughs> and then they right. kind of wander off. Um, and and I guess I'm 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 going to hold at least some breath for the fact that, and this is probably copium, that maybe NAGR is going to go back to the Fifth Circuit and run crying and screaming and going, Your Honor, they broke the injunction. They broke the injunction. They broke the injunction. I doubt that they'd be able to get away with that, and I doubt they're going to do it because the scope of the injunction is so narrow. Yeah. But, it would be absolutely hilarious to get. I think it. I think it was Reed O'Connor, the judge that did this. Like, get in front of him and be like, "Your Honor, the ATF broke your rule. What are you gonna do to him?" <laughs> that said, you know, this this having happened outside of the Fifth Circuit probably yeah. really limits the possibility for this. But the whole thing is nightmarish in terms of its complication. Yes. The yeah, I don't even. I don't even know. It would. T- it would be a whole hour long episode of us just talking about like what could happen there. Uh, right. Here's the question. Do you think Twin Bros should sue? I think Twin Bros should retain criminal defense counsel on their own, independent of any of these gun rights groups. Yeah. Because that's, well, I guess I, I'm, not, I'm not going to mention the case, but there have been other cases where people doing flirting with the law stuff have you know, initially had counsel that was provided to them by these gun rights groups and that was not good or competent. It was... It was silly. Uh, So they should get their own criminal defense counsel that is good and has their actual best interests at heart. Then then and only after they have competent criminal defense should they then turn to the gun rights groups and I think count, you know, bring their own civil lawsuit where they say, hey, yo, this is not. Yeah, you have to make sure the burners are off. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think I think I agree. I think the. um, I think the action, like if they were my client, I would advise them to like chill for a minute, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that said, you can get an injunction if you immediately pursue the right, like the civil court, which could then I don't know. See, it's, it's complicated, right? Uh, because like being aggressive could get you peace of mind earlier, but then if you be aggressive and you don't get the injunction. <laughs> Then you have a lot less peace of mind. Yes. Uh, so it's 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 a terrible situation. Terrible situation. So we should move forward. I guess one final note do do we do we want to talk about the question of common use? Because I saw about a million people be like, "Oh, but oh. there's so many of these. It's common use." Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we okay. We should we should get into that and that be its own little section. Let's talk about the common use question. This is a thing that pisses me off in how often I see people like chanting common use, one, as if it were a test, it's not, and two, as if it were some saving grace, it's not. Um, Let me give you the end at the beginning. You do not want common use to be the standard. Yes. At least not the sole and exclusive one. Yes, you. It might be like an enhancer, right? Yes. But if we get again skipping to the end, people are saying, "Oh, well, they've sold so many, so they must be in common use." Well, if we're going to latch to that, it would be common lawful use for lawful purposes. Uh, uh, that's not <laughs> sure right? it's not a tango that you want to dance um but on top of that i don't think they've moved that many because we still don't know what the number is i think that we know there's been a couple thousand maybe 
Right. Like if, if we had the guest, just, just given the, the right. relative popularity we've seen on the internet. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, so let's say this is the avenue we want to take. We've got the flag post in Keitano, which was a quarter million, right? Right. Well, again, we got the flag post from Keitano, which was a quarter million, but that was also just a concurrence in Keitano. Yes. <laughs> and it yeah. wasn't even it, proposed as a test in the concurrence. It exactly. Was just like a, it was like a look. But let's say we do it the way you guys think it is and say that is our flagpole. It's 250,000. Not there. <laughs> yeah, not, not there. Um, <laughs> and then, like, you have something, anything. If it's new, you are incentivizing the ATF to attack it as aggressively and violently as possible <laughs> so that the common use analysis happens when the product is brand new like that's the result of pursuing that line uh i think we should all just like forget about that language and just never bring it up again right <laughs> it, it, it's relevant to the passage where it was actually cited in heller where they're talking right. about the historical tradition of banning the carriage of firearms that are both dangerous and unusual and then them saying that the, the historical tradition of banning the carriage of dangerous and unusual weapons in such a way as to incite panic in ordinary people. Right. The, the, it's, it's, essentially brandishing firearm, brandishing weapons. Right. That were exactly. Uncommon. It, it, like it dude, didn't make sense for you to have. Right. It, th this was, and this all ties back to the statute of Northampton, which was passed because you know <laughs> the governing people were scared uh by roving bandits coming around with like flaming i don't know flaming right? like, laces flaming covered laces. in human yeah. feces <laughs> <laughs> just swinging them around going woo right and this was done on purpose <laughs> to make people not be there anymore so <laughs> that again that it made sense for that because heller was reasoning backwards for like government you're saying we can do it but whereas there, you know, we're not talking about the carriage of a weapon in Heller. We're talking about something that is so common that it is overwhelmingly chosen by Americans. Well, like that's where that comes from is the explanation of why the statute of Northampton doesn't apply. Right. And they, they explained that you know, the statute of Northampton could be dispositively disproven, right? You could like, right. you could clearly say, well, it's not valid here because if it's in common use, it's not unusual. So right. we can, we can throw that analog out. It doesn't apply. Yeah, without even engaging with the rest of it. And and it made perfect sense there. It doesn't continue to make sense as we try to apply it going forward. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, it 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 when you first hear the terms common lawful use, you think to yourself, like I can understand the inclination to want that, right? Because you right. think to yourself, that means that it's all my guns, everything I have, right? Yeah, all my guns are super common. <laughs> right. But then the question is. What about, uh, you know, there's weird laws respecting caseless ammunition. Do we want, uh, right, the, the question of whether you can have a caseless rifle to be all related? Like, if they made a caseless rifle ban right now, should the question be how many people still have DAISY VLs? Right. And I, this, this question really begs, you know, it, it really begs at the, the, the complaint of Heller which is the oh it's hopelessly circular mm -hmm. and heller is hopelessly circular if you're if, if if you just like take common use completely out of context and, right. and you read it as oh that the only way a gun is protected is if it's co in common use and if it's in common use it's wholly protected right it's if not, it's in common use for lawful purposes like self-defense and then if right. you're illinois you <laughs> it's in common use yeah. it's common use only for self-defense, and that means literally <laughs> killing people with it. Yeah, if, you're not, if you're not killing like one bandit a night with your AR-15, you do not need it. Yeah, no, and so that's that's why only 22s are protected, according to <laughs> Illinois, because they are consistently being used to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but yeah, so that's that that we just wanted to make sure to nail on that right because people have the inclination of bringing it up, and it's. It kind of is a, a thing that feels good to say. Um, stop saying it. <laughs> at least, at least say it less. Or if you yeah. want to sound really smart, say it in the context to which it's appropriate. 
Right. So like, you know, if, if anti gunners are insisting that this can be banned because it's dangerous and unusual, then you could point to the, well, there's actually a lot of them. It's not unusual. Right. But I think, I think the Supreme court is going to need to step in and clarify what the dangerous means and what right. the unusual because as, means. as opposed to what, right? right. Like it has to be it for that word to not be surplusage. It has to be dangerous as opposed to the ordinary weapon because weapons are dangerous. They Inherent. wouldn't be weapons if they it's kind of, kind of why they made them actually. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They're good for that. But anyway, speaking of dangerous and unusual, guys, you will be both if you go to vzgrips.com and use our promotional code this week 15 to amp up your lethality. You need to turn up the pressure. You need to get your gun killier with a VZ Grips VZ320 texture option available for your Kimber K6. Uh, I recently picked up another gun that I found out had VZ grips. It was a 1911 gun. Uh, nice. Let's go on and and not question <laughs> question. What, oh, oh wait, there's a oh. Cobra. We recently got a uh, a snake gun. Would the Cobra grips fit on it? I don't think so. Oh, that's worthless for me. What about okay? All revolver get grips. We need the code uh, guys getting the get getting the order and then in the comments say that they need to make Draco grips and then Anaconda grips. Yeah, cool. The yeah, because my Anaconda don't have hyena brown and I need that. I don't know, they come over and all that stuff. But anyway, guys, that's vzgrips.com. You need fifteen percent off if you use my code. That's the this week fifteen, T H I S W E E K one five. Uh check if your Anaconda does. All right. Next up, we are talking about, we have a winner for state number 29 in terms of the constitutional carry. Constitutional. No, it's a permitless carry. Uh, and that is South Carolina. Woohoo! Constitutional carry bill heads to governor's desk following South Carolina lawmakers approval. The idea of permitless carry for South Carolinians is coming closer to a reality. House Bill 3594, also known as the South Carolina Constitutional Carry slash Second Amendment Preservation Act, <laughs> 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 is passed by South Carolina senators. Um, so yeah, that's that's good. Of course, it's not actually constitutional carry right? because they nope. still uh, they're like we still have to be able to harass some people if they carry yes. guns. So. Um, yeah, the bill will also offer free concealed weapons trading through SLED. However, even with the changes, Democratic senators continue to raise questions. <gasps> now, Senator Margie Matthews, I'm concerned about those police officers that will not be able to properly stop and inquire about why a person has a gun laid out on the seat of the car. Get fucked, pig. <laughs> There's your <laughs> answer. <laughs> Matthews believes this discussion will continue, but with a different tone. We're going to find ourselves in a situation where somebody is going to get killed and it's going to try to strike real close to home. The wrong person is going to get killed. And then we're going to come to find ourselves coming back in here and saying, we need to protect law enforcement. Right. Yeah, maybe someone will do that. Because <laughs> before this bill, it was illegal to shoot cops. And then after this bill, it's illegal to shoot cops. And that clearly means there's going to be a market increase in the shooting of cops. No, that's right. Because it's the Second Amendment Preservation Act. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Did this bill do something really cool? <laughs> I understand. Uh, it also added new graduated penalties for weapons violations. Uh you also, and they added they added a mandatory reporting. You have ten days to report if your weapons was stolen. Originally, it was thirty, so that's great. And, oh, by the way, it also prohibits guns at hospitals, polling places, government buildings, and schools. So it's a very constitutional carry bill. Of course, it's very constitutional carry. The uh, the, the the mandatory reporting one is interesting because I know the. You know, the anti-gun push to start doing that was largely born from, like, you, you could avoid gun trafficking charges by losing your gun, like, air quotes, losing it, where it's like, somebody lost $1,500 in an envelope, and you lost your gun, and it was on the same bench. Right. And, like, you took the envelope, because you're like, darn, I lost my gun, and somebody yeah. else took your gun. You, you you understand, right? Like, it's, exactly. oh, I didn't no, tell yeah. it, I just lost the gun. But if you're not required to report it, you can just keep losing guns and then keep finding envelopes full of money in your mailbox. 
and and just go you know go on about your life and you're not dealing guns you're but not here's the issue if you've lost your gun what if you don't know you've lost it right right and, like, and so th- there's certainly like some requirement for is it center is is the is yeah. the terms so like you like 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 a you you have to know that you've actually broken the law and so a lot of it'll depend times, on I, people snitching on themselves uh, you know, the, i think yeah. this law necessarily turns into you know the people who were like repeatedly losing guns and finding sacks of of, of money yeah. aren't going to stop doing that like this isn't really going to stop them from doing that meanwhile eventually this is going to end up you know hurting somebody who didn't mean any harm right this is this is you know, it's a lot like a safe storage laws yeah. where it it's it's only going to let prosecutors come after you know like let's say a parent on the worst day of their life where their kid right. gets into a gun and does something horrible with it yeah like, like the kid got into the gun ran off for weeks right and then did a a, a notable uh way that and uh then I don't, I, don't, I don't see how punishing the parent helps anyone that's going to be the result situation. right because we know that the the traditional applicant, right, would would be the person who loses the gun and finds the money. They're going to still, they're not going to have the wherewithal <laughs> to say, "I lost. It. I I don't know when I lost it, but I I just found out because you told me." Right. Right. Uh, they're going to be like, "Oh, I haven't seen that gun in months," <laughs> and that's right, that's how they're going to get them, uh, because they know exactly where the gun went. They know when it went, and that's when they're going to say they haven't seen it. Right, right. Because they they believe that there's magic and that they can trace the gun, <laughs> and the gun told them who used it. Right, right. My owner shot this guy on the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, that's so that's the thing. I mean, I guess congratulations. It just seems like all of these things are. It it seems like every time we get a permitless carry bill, it's a pyrrhic victory. It's it's never clean. It's and, yeah, it, it, and I'd say usually actually slightly worse off like i got i got bitched at i got screamed at by the florida republican caucus or whatever the hell they call themselves because i vocally opposed the florida carry bill where i'm like this actually makes it more confusing to have a drake in your car and they're like shut up Matt! <laughs> let us have this but uh i i just think it sucks if a if your state if you're a state legislator and you're a you're a big fan of me and you want me to approve and endorse your bill, I know that's not real, but uh, <laughs> have it be just deletions. Have it literally like you yes. can do it. You can just delete from the code. You can do it. <laughs> uh, that would be good. That would be what I'd call a constitutional carry bill. I would call a bill a constitutional carry bill if it literally just deleted every reference to carrying a firearm. Period. Yep. That's how. That's the only way to do it. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, but yeah. So next up, uh, so that was the good news. Bad news. Uh, first Circuit decides that mag bans are totally okay because, of course, they did. Now, what happened here, Ivan? So this is a this this is a case that's been going on for a while now, uh, from from Rhode Island is where it had started out. I've and heard the, that uh, state. <laughs> one of the states. Uh, so the lower court came to the conclusion that magazines are not arms. You know, y- using the same sort of like post Bruin reasoning we've seen, where they're like, uh, because of interest, like the, the interest balance their way to decide that it's not arms. Where it's like right. now instead of two steps, we're at three steps. Right. <laughs> which is great. We just need we just need more steps. It's easy. Uh, and and so the the circuit court took a little bit of a different tack because they didn't they didn't come right out and say we think magazines are arms because like the the first circuit like pick any three judges on the first circuit they're going to be so anti gun that they wouldn't even give you they wouldn't even give you like the little like the little token the little cookie of like oh well we think they're arms we just don't think they're protected arms they wouldn't even come out and say they're arms but they went into a bunch of analysis about. If if we said they were arms, this is why they wouldn't be protected. So they're like, you know, they're having their cake and eating it too. But as far as us gun owners are concerned, they're 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 shitting on you and then making you eat the shit. It's pretty <laughs> pretty pretty tough. Uh, but you know, they, they ended up coming to the conclusion that uh, the the right to self defense isn't meaningfully hampered by us taking away ten round magazines. That's interest balancing, right. by the way. That's literally interest balancing. That's that's all that happened under interest balancing. Uh, no. While concluding that 
the the ban actually serves a strong purpose of uh, stopping mass shooters because apparently if you have to self defend yourself, ten rounds is more than plenty. But you can change magazines quickly if you need to. Meanwhile, in a mass shooting, it will take them so long to change a magazine that lives will be saved. I'm not exactly sure how that works out, or if they if they think that's if that's consistent, but uh, it isn't, and so. It seems like this is this is of course at the preliminary injunction stage still for for reference. So it could be appealed to the Supreme Court, but I doubt you know, I, I would not hold my breath at all on the Supreme Court taking this case because they have I would say more ripe or more relevant yeah. uh hardware ban cases before them. Uh I guess of of note on that on that front. Uh Bianchi, which is if, if you guys remember, is the New Jersey uh assault weapons ban case that it had been emergency appealed to the supreme court after the three judge panel had like a year after the three judge panel heard the case the whole circuit on bonk took it away from them and so then the plaintiffs were like yeah no that's stupid and appealed to the supreme court and the state of new jersey has asked for an extension in that case so there is some movement on it and the supreme court did grant the extension which I saw some people doom and gloom posting. I think that's actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. If the Supreme Court is wanting this, I mean, that's an, incl- an indication they want it better briefed. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad sign. So the state's going to get more time to reply. That's okay, I think, in this yeah. case. And so you, that that case is closely interlinked with the Illinois assault weapons and magazine ban. And I think that if one of the two of them are going to be taken. I think New Jersey is the most likely, and then the Illinois cases are second most likely. I think if this Rhode Island mag ban were to be appealed, I think it would be fairly unlikely that it would be taken simply because the the Bianchi and the Illinois cases are pretty closely interlinked because of the the reasoning involved in the Illinois cases is directly based on the reasoning, the, the horrible reasoning that upheld the uh, New mm. Jersey assault weapons ban thus far. Yeah, so I mean, it, do we know if they're going to appeal? Uh, we don't yet. I hadn't. I hadn't yeah. seen anything, at least as of today. I think this. Well, they don't have. Came... They don't have an incredible amount of time, but I, I do think this would be something to appeal just for. Yes. Because um, eventually we're going to get. So I guess the the thing to say is this should be appealed, but what's going to happen? Ideal world, or even like you know, slightly less than terrible world would be this gets held, and then GVR after another hardware yes. ban case happens. Uh, GVR be meaning. Grant vacate review, and and what that what that means is basically because the Supreme Court is discretionary, something only happens to your case if the court touches it, right? The Supreme Court has to touch it, otherwise, the the circuit court's ruling stays the law. And so, in situations like this, they grant certiorari, vacate. The, just basically, they're like, oh, granted, zoop, deleted. Remand, go back, do it again. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's pretty clear what the court's saying when it does that. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, this would be a very bad case, I think, to get on all fours with just because it's not it's not something that has principles or tests to properly suss out. And uh, the, the the opinion the you know the, the opinion that was written by this panel is bad. I I do I'm not going right. to pretend it's good. However, it was it was almost like it was an intentionally intentionally written so that it would be really hard to appeal because it's not it's not like a dog like the the the, the, you know, the contrasted with the Illinois opinion the Illinois opinion is like dog shit pants on head sh- shits on fire really really bad like the, it it seemed like and in fact they even came right out and said you know, they they were just short of saying I should say that Heller and Bruin are totally unworkable and so we're going to come up with our own test and our own opinions and our own nonsense. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's sort of how that came off. Th- 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 meanwhile, with this uh, Rhode Island mag ban, they at least pretended to have been following Bruin, and you th- then came to like all sorts of bizarre conclusions that like uh, magazines that have eleven rounds are more like M16s and Bowie knives, which the Supreme Court said could be banned. They haven't said those could be banned. <laughs> <laughs> they're just making that up or you know, they're, they're doing the, the 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 i guess it's it's the new in vogue thing for anti-gun judges to do where they're like oh the supreme court said m16s could be banned in heller despite the fact that the supreme court did not say that m16s <laughs> could be banned in heller right yeah if we, but hold on but if the supreme court had said that m16s could be banned in heller then the ar-15 can be banned because it's an m16 wait no <gasps> the m16 yeah right 
Then you can ban the AR-15 because the M16 is an AR-15. I mean, it is. Yeah. So that's the law. I mean. If they said that. Right. And they did. They totally said it, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, so that... There, there's a lot of baked into that analogy. Will, all right, guys. Now let's talk about some good news, and that is that FFL Payment Solutions exists. Guys, FFL Payment is a credit card processing company that is run by FFLs for FFLs. I promise you that they're going to save you a lot of money. And if you get in contact with them and tell them that Fudbuster sent you, you're going to get a free terminal, guys. That's a big dollar value, and it's on. It's on me. So get get hooked up with FFL Payment Solutions. They're never going to deny your business just because you deal in fun stuff. And uh, and again, you tell them Fudbuster sent you, you get your terminal for free. Next up, let's talk about what we were alluding to earlier. And that's the, the bump stock case. We saw oral argument on, and that was like the day after we posted the last yep. This Week in Guns, which was so frustrating. And uh, it was almost as frustrating as the oral arguments themselves. It was, I, I think, in the end, the you know the arguments for our side were good. I think they could have been better. There was there was maybe you know there was some concessions made that I think were unforced, mm-hmm. but there was a there was a lot of arguments from the anti gun you know the, the government side that I think a lot of the justices saw through or in the alternative asked the correct questions about where they were. They were really trying to pull at the thread of you know, the way the government and the anti-gun justices and the anti-gun lawyers want this case to be decided is more along what they what they argue the intent of the law is, which is regulating guns with high rates of fire. Right. And they, they kept wanting to like poke some hole in where the function of the trigger is to make a gun shoot faster or slower, as opposed to the function of the trigger is talking about... The, triggers role in the firing mechanism which right. i think is the most it's the most consistently applicable way to read that section of the statute because if you turn to one of function of the trigger is what the person functioning the trigger has the trigger do i think you run into all sorts of weird situations where there's some like like all triggers work in common to the extent of the hammer releases the striking mechanism if that's an open bolt, if that's a hammer, if that's a linear striker, if right. that's some weird combination of any of these things. The trigger always will work to release this striking member that strikes either directly on the cartridge or directly on the a firing pin and then fires the round. Right. They all have this in common and it's consistently applicable. Unfortunately, that sort of uh, technical argument wasn't really brought up. It was like right. toyed at. It was toyed at just at the fringes. And right. so I was surprised to hear uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett was the one who asked, I thought, the the best questions as far as actually understanding how guns work. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll give some of the other justices the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they already know. I don't think they do. Uh, with the exception of, uh, you know, Alito demonstrated an understanding of how select fire firearms work which I was kind of impressed by, although he, he insinuated it from a standpoint of like, you have to hold the selector in the full auto position while you shoot an M16, uh, yeah. which uh, it's not quite right, but maybe the one he shot. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe if it's, I guess, technically speaking, you know, if you do leave the detent out, you know, the safety <laughs> selector detent out, it will constantly try and put itself on semi-auto. So <laughs> maybe his was broken. Yeah, yeah no, it would. Um, yeah, no, Barrett. And, and so here's the thing is they're, they're, the two sides here, the two genders of this <laughs> argument were, do you look at the phrase single function of the trigger from the perspective of the firearm mechanically or from the perspective of the shooter, right? And the whole reason you have to have such a dipshit, stupid uh, distinction is if you are trying to contort single function, right? Right. Because I think the only way it makes sense without any circular logic is mechanically from the perspective of the gun right because like they didn't use the word pull they knew the word pull right and that's because they knew that there were such things as release triggers and guess what even back then there were pull and release triggers i mean it's very rare but i think there were some shotguns where it would fire on the pull and the release or paddle um, triggers and all sorts yeah. of 
you know, they were aware of different trigger mechanisms existing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and even some guns were, uh, it was actually more common at the time uh, where pulling the trigger was an integral part of the, of, of like functioning the action. Right. Uh, but anyway, that's all nerd stuff. The point is, is that the, the anti-gun side or the anti-right side or the pro-government side, right, is saying, oh no, it has to be viewed from the perspective of the shooter. And if from the perspective of the shooter, you're just doing one thing, that's a single function of the trigger. Which is, a, I mean, I, I, I don't know how anybody can look at that and not think that that's the stretch and the yeah. one that isn't a stretch. Of is... the treasure trigger. Right. Right. Like, um, oh, go on. The, 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 the sort of thing that they're dealing with with bump stocks is technically your finger itself doesn't move relative to the bump stock. It stays in the same place. It stays on, on the finger ledge. And you push forward in what they allege to be a continuous motion with your other hand. Now, if you truly pushed forward in a in a continuous motion to the extent of you just pushed forward as hard as you could, you'd get one shot and that's it. Right? That's how right. bump stocks work. It's maintaining a consistent amount of pressure, which from a standpoint of sum of forces... Uh, the pressure that you're putting forward has to be overwhelmed by the recoil of the gun or else the thing doesn't work. And I think from, from like, like if they were to stand up there like a bunch of physics nerds in front of a chalkboard, maybe you could argue it's a consistent force, but it's not a consistent, you know, some, like the, you know, the sum of forces is not going to give you a consistent magnitude because the thing's moving back and forth. I think that sort of means that it's not on you because because the, the the two sort of things they're arguing here is single function of the trigger what does that mean and what does automatically mean because it's the other sort of key phrase that's got a hook in this in this decision making process i think if the sum of forces are changing direction there i don't know that i would consider it being automatically from a physics perspective anyway right it's not it's not self-acting it's not self-regulating especially if you compare it to something like an actual machine gun where you just hold down the trigger and then yeah. the gun, you know, the gun does the automatic firing, right? And, and again, that's something that I wish would have been, and I think I think it wasn't one of the briefs. I don't remember which brief, but it was briefed better where right. automatically at that time as it pertained to firearms meant it was a sum of two things, right? A semi-automatic, you know, at the beginning, in the beginning, there was <laughs> automatic firearms. Right. And automatic was like an automatic repeater. It means that it was a repeater, like a lever action, bolt action, slide action, these sorts of things, but it loaded itself. That was an automatic firearm. It meant automatic loading. Eventually, you get firearms that are automatic loading and automatic firing. They right. fire themselves. Those become fully automatic, and things that you have to pull the trigger each time or do something different with the trigger each time become semi-automatic. I think, I think the best way to understand what they meant by automatically was look at you know, the terminology of the time, which is an automatic firearm fires automatically. And mm -hmm. it's talking about the gun itself, right? Yeah. Uh, Without firearm, further action from the user. A firearm equipped with a bump stock does not fire automatically in that case. It is right. still a semi-automatic mechanism, although it's got some accoutrement on it that maybe makes it so you can shoot it semi-automatically faster. It does not amount to it being automatic firing because we're talking about the actual mechanism of the firearm. Right. Uh, there was some interesting briefing that occurred regarding, well, what if you bump you do that you bump bump fire happens without a bump stock, right? It's right. something that you can just do. It's something that has existed for some time, and uh, I think the I think the answers for our side were much more convincing than from the government side. Uh, the government side is you know they would consider bumps firing without a bump stock to be sort of like a Oh, it's just something that happens, but it takes a lot more skill. It takes yeah. a, a little bit more balancing of force. It's like, like you know, they're, they're trying to find some distinction between it makes it easier and it just happens automatically. And I don't yeah. like like you know, it, again. It's these it's these questions of of user skill. I don't know that you can make a determination on the on the statutory interpretation of this. Right? It doesn't say automatically with sufficient skill of the shooter. It leave it you know, it leaves that open. And I yeah. think I think it leaving that open is probably a sign that they're not they're not leaving it up to well a sufficiently a sufficiently talented or sufficiently trained right. shooter could shoot this gun really really fast by utilizing some technique so you can't have it. I I think the ATF's answer in that case was extremely unconvincing. 
I think right. the answer from our side was was <clears throat> much more convincing. Where it's yeah, it it, it, it makes a, a natural phenomenon in firearms easier, maybe more accessible. The one thing that they said that I thought was kind of stupid is they tried to they tried to incorporate the whole oh it was for disabled shooters to help them shoot quicker. Oh my just god! Stop. Just don't just don't know stop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It went what and. There was some confusion I saw about that where it was like, oh, oh, you idiots. That was for pistol braces. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, you... there was there was some good stuff here that where they almost so there's this part around page uh, 39. That's the Miku number of the transcript uh, where they start. They're forcing the government attorney to like engage with. With what are the actual principal distinctions, right? Saying, I think the the Giffords Amicus brief says the theoretical maximum for a very skilled competition shooter with a specialized weapon is something like 180 bullets a minute in terms of semi-automatic, and then they start really drilling into well, how much slower really, and it kind of starts to get teased out, and they almost go there, but I don't think any of them really had the sufficient know-how um, to ask the questions to completely undermine the fact that the amount of the amount of rounds you can discharge in a minute you know with reloads and everything between a fully automatic and a semi-automatic is not enough for there to be a principal distinction right i mean cuz uh, cuz you can find examples of machine guns that are actual machine guns single function of the trigger automatically blah 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 actual machine guns that shoot slower than even mediocre barely trained shooters can shoot semi-automatic firearms like you know, i'm sure you and my eyes mind both goes to the show shaw yes it shoots slow enough as a machine gun that you could totally outrun it with an ar or a glock or an ak or almost anything uh right. it, it, the, the, like it the show shaw shoots at like 200 rounds a minute it's and really, that's a machine gun. really slow yeah that's a machine gun i paid taxes on it uh the grease gun there is no way that you could run a grease gun, right? And if it was a shoot rounds in a minute competition, that I wouldn't be able to run circles around you with a you know any normal semi-automatic gun. Um, but the here's the thing I don't understand. They keep talking about bullets a minute, bullets a minute, bullets a minute, right? And they they're saying, oh, a skilled competition shooter, blah blah blah, they can only really shoot 180 bullets a minute. In terms of shooting cadence, that's like, duh, 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 right? Yeah. And then they say, oh, but the the you know the M sixteen can go up to nine hundred and fifty. So all of a sudden, what that means is, on the machine gun side, you're allowed to use its cyclic rate. Yep. Right. Which it cannot do for a whole minute unless you have like a neat belt system. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think, I think a full minute of straight sustained fire would melt. Uh, Most AR fifteens yeah. would would not. They'd get sad. Yeah, like you know, five, five or six hundred rounds is the point that a gas tube usually usually bursts. Of course, there's you know higher temp gas tubes or better barrel profiles or all sorts of things that can fix that. But that's not right, normal. But the gas tube acts as a fuse, right? Right. So why? Why can we Im uh, impute the cyclic rate of the weapon on one side and then take into account all of these other factors? Reloads are aiming because 180 yeah. rounds per minute competition shooter, blah, blah. That's that's yeah. a load of horse hockey because you can you can be barely good, barely versed at shooting guns and pull the trigger. In fact, uh, I, I can remember going shooting with my, uh, I, guess, I guess then he, like, he, he was young enough a cousin that he wasn't holding the guns on his own. He was just like sort of aiming them while, while his dad would hold the gun up and mm -hmm. he just sort of like get behind the scope and just pull the trigger as fast as he could. <laughs> like the Little young master Braden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, like the young master, like, like the young master Braden. He'd be, he'd be tearing through mags in a, as a, a Marlin tube fed 22, but not mags, I guess in that case, but yeah. he, tube, he'd be tube. dumping, he'd be dumping 10 rounds, you know, lickety split way <laughs> faster than three rounds per second. Right. Yeah. yeah, so like, I just think that's so interesting. And I actually started to stop and think about it. And I mean, if I had two ARs, right, I really think that, and one was like this raced out competition gun and the other was a bog standard M16. I feel like if I had 
all the mags in the world and the special gas tube that isn't a fuse um and you gave me a minute i feel like there would be at most what do you think over the course of a whole minute what 30 percent difference in terms of assuming round counter, both of them are stuck with 30 round mags probably yeah. a 30 30 percent is probably pretty pretty fair but like if you stick the m16 with its period correct 20 rounders yeah. <laughs> i think i think the story starts to change pretty dramatically where it i mean you know, the presence or absence of select fire, even 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 if it's just volume of fire that you're looking at, right? It, 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 it doesn't does, make that there's no principle. Difference. There's no principle. There's no right. Even, even if it was they double. spit lead, it's what they do. Even with a what? Even if it was double, right? If it was if you shot fifty yeah. percent more rounds with the with the machine gun, a hundred percent more rounds with the yeah. machine gun, fifty percent with the with the non. Uh, I don't. I don't know that that makes a principal distinction. Because yeah, is that substantially less lethal? It's still a ton of rounds. <laughs> it's still incredibly lethal. So I. I think that it's stupid, and the fact that they sat there on all fours engaging with rounds a minute so long without realizing that, right? Like they came so close to actually being like, wait, 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 right? But then they they went off track. Um, but yeah, so that was the 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 two main camps here. Are is is it single function of the trigger? Is it from the perspective of the trigger or the perspective of the shooter? I think it. I think it has to be from the perspective of the trigger. Um, it has to be. That there's you, you. You. You'll. You'll end up with a lot of. And I, I guess this is. You know, this is really the danger with. And I'm not going to pretend that across the board the conservative justices yeah. are more principled when it comes to this stuff, but at least as it comes to to guns the questions they were asking made it clear that they were going to be principled on this distinction the anti-gun judges made it very clear that they wanted this whole thing to turn on what they thought somebody else's intent behind passing the law at the time might have been which is just it's it's nonsensical it's uh oh it shoots so many rounds that it, 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 it in the time no no you can't have it and and i've seen some analysis that you know the, the the big danger with that sort of thing is it legitimizes the uh, it's sort of a newer anti-gunner position where it's any device that increases the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm and they don't define that at all it's just any device any part that mm -hmm. increases its rate of fire can be banned and they pretend that like oh we're banning these like wannabe machine gun conversion devices but then that would also ban binary triggers. It would ban just lighter triggers, maybe like a heavier recoil spring because that will increase the cyclic rate some. So it, it bans all sorts of then yeah. things, things that we would call unintended, but right. anti-gunners are full well aware of what <laughs> they're like, doing. No. Is it guns? <laughs> it's intended. So it's uh I I I you know, so I guess as far as predictions go, I my, my initial prediction is probably gonna be wrong. Uh, because my initial prediction was that the Supreme Court would decide this along the lines of the rule of lenity. They'd just yeah. straight up say it's ambiguous, tie goes to the to the plaintiff. Uh, in this case, though, uh, the, the rule of lenity, I don't think was mentioned a single time. Which uh, which people were theory crafting on, right? They were trying to read the tea leaves and be like, right. oh no, they were doing that on purpose. And, and it, I think I think that was my, my my tea leaf reading essentially came down to if I was on the Supreme Court, right, they're, they're supposed to be the ones who answer these sorts of questions. Like they are the, I mean, they're the Supreme Court, right? They're the one, they're, they're, the, they're the last stop on this on this wild train ride. So if they're unable to answer the question, it's a, it's a problem. And they shouldn't go into these sort of debates trying to see if they can't answer it. That's that's mm -hmm. bad, right? They shouldn't be engaging in a discussion of why can't we answer this? That's, 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 that's <laughs> not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it means you're down the wrong track. So why and don't you so, step back? And so um, I imagine I imagine maybe the justice is conferred, or maybe they're just all smart enough to know. We don't we don't engage in discussions of we can't answer this because we're too dumb to figure it out. <laughs> they, should, they should at least give it an honest try. And if it comes right. down to across the nine justices, there's three that like one opinion, three that like another, and three that like another. I think it's at that point that they engage in a hey guys, maybe this is ambiguous. <laughs> maybe we can't figure it out. And then rule of lenity should carry the day. Right. No, oh, 100%. So what I, here's my prediction, which again is that and a quarter would have bought you a gun a gumball years ago. Um, I think 
it'll be colored by the rule of lenity, but not actually, yes. right? So I think they won't say they're deciding it on lenity grounds. I think they'll say that there is not sufficient hook in the statute, right? right. So it's like we had all of this argument over from whose perspective, like blah, 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 blah. I think that goes to show that this isn't a line that you get to draw and that Congress should do it, right? Uh, and so that can leave it in terms of APA, right, and, and rulemaking authority without cutting directly into the rule of lenity, which I don't know why they don't like to decide things on in lenity terms, um, it, possibly because lenity, it doesn't really foreclose them from doing the exact same thing again. Right. So, so I don't know. That's, that's my thought. My thought is that the opinion will read as if it was one of lenity, but be stylized as something else. I want to be a massive optimist, and my, my, my optimist take is there's going to be enough judges convinced that we're going to get at least one of the two sticking points in this case, either single function of the trigger or automatically. Mm. A victory on one or either of those would be huge. I think yeah. I think single function of the trigger would be the bigger one. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think automatically teaches us anything we don't or lets us do. <laughs> lets us do that's such, a, such a bleak way to look at this. I don't yeah. think it lets us do anything that we can't already do. Right. Meanwhile, I think that single function of the trigger, because that that's what underlies FRTs or our binary super safeties. I yeah. mean, so single function of the trigger is what really what underlies ATF trying to say that FRTs are also no good. Right. Because you know the. That, that that if they the same if, perspective argument if the supreme court comes back and says single function of the trigger is from the perspective of the shooter and not the trigger so bump stocks fail on that but we don't think bump stocks are automatic because you're pushing your hand forward and then the it's changing direction right bump stocks would then be okay <laughs> ah, yeah i don't know about frts guys i think i think frts would still be up in the air at at best right but in reality it's probably them them quietly saying yeah no uh, you can't have those, at least not for now. Right. Yeah. I hate, I hate this though. I hate, why can't we just get rid of it all? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it would, it would be nice if the questions could just be answered instead of it being this, it's, it's, it's the, what, what is it? generational game. <laughs> Bread and circus is what they call it. Or it's like, yeah. a, we show up for a big show and it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Honk, it's all honk. performative. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of performative, the Undetectable Firearms Act has been extended to 2031. Yes. Buried in an appropes appropriation bill. As you, it's 1,050 pages. And we can control F. Womp womp. Section 22F, 2, 2 of the Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988 is amended by striking 35 years and inserting March 8th, 2031. Yeah, so the, the Undetectable Firearms Act is a is a good one. Just to you know parrot the usual talking points. Nobody's ever been tried or convicted under this because undetectable firearms as the act defines them really don't exist. And they all still use metal ammunition that metal detectors and especially X-ray machines can detect, and also right. X-ray machines detect polymer. Uh so it's it's kind of a silly thing in the first place. Uh this most recent time was probably the best shot at not renewing it we've ever really had. Uh, but a as usual, uh, our, our good old trusty uh, GOP is fantastic at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the anti-gunners wanted a permanent reauthorization of it. Uh, the GOP wanted to get rid of it. Uh, they compromised with what is it like seven years, three years or something that we've got it sticking around longer. It's a, it's 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 a mess. I I do know there was there was, there, there was like a, a number of hours for which it wasn't actually in effect anymore, mm -hmm. which is uh which is kind of funny. There was there was a number number of hours that you could have made your own undetectable firearm and been fine, but of course there's no there's no grandfathering provision in it. So right. now you have to get rid of it. Womp womp, uh, big sad. It's a. A ridiculous law and i guess the the silver lining here the good news is in the past when anti-gunners have tried to reauthorize the undetectable firearms act they've tried to reword it the way that uh, the anti-gun organizations want to reword it which right. would essentially uh, ban 
any frame or receiver that isn't made out of metal. Um, mm-hmm. New York currently has you know, the, the way that New York's you know, New York has a copycat version of the undetectable undetectable firearms act. But in, in, in its definition of major component, it says that none of the major components can be undetectable and defines a frame on its own as being mm-hmm. a major component. Now, you know, for the, for the knowledgeable viewers out there, you'll realize that this means that Glock frames on their own, like if you strip yeah. a Glock down to its frame, technically you've made an undetectable firearm because a Glock frame does not have 3.7 ounces of stainless steel. <laughs> in, it. in fact, a stripped Glock frame barely weighs 3.7 ounces <laughs> it's got very very little metal in it at all right and so uh, certainly the, the you know the undetectable firearms act as the anti-gunners want to implement it would would certainly ban you from your know, 3d printing or from making from an 80 percent any sort of polymer frame but in actuality would ban like all popular handguns from the past 20 years yeah. 30 40 years <laughs> Uh, it would, yeah. would would go about banning a, a ton of stuff. Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting because I I wonder if even some of the alloy frame guns could meet the security exemplar. Uh, I don't know if they as, could. As I mean, it has to be it has to have the metal detectability of three point seven ounces of stainless steel. And stainless so it, is pretty dense. Of course, you know, metal detectability doesn't care about density. It's about it's about magnetic permeability. I think is how you actually end up measuring that. It's it's like a because it's a a stupid scientific thing to actually go about measuring it's why they defined detectable with a security exemplar so like yeah whichever whichever made up agency is tasked with administering this <laughs> has exemplars and it's 3.7 ounces of stainless steel in the shape of a gun right and you know, they're, they're meant to tune metal detectors so that they always pick that up that you know 100 percent of the time they pick right. it up and that like 50 percent of the times it would pick up half of that etc cetera, etc cetera. Which is, you know, sometimes at like the baseball park when you go to watch the old ball game. Sometimes you can just walk straight through with your phone in your pocket and your belt still on, and they just wave right. you through. Then you don't set it off. And sometimes the guy behind you does set it off because, like, sometimes the guy behind you is me and he forgot he has his multi tool, and then they send you out. <laughs> yeah. I had just enough metal that I couldn't make it through. Right. And so, uh, you know, metal detectors aren't, you know, aren't necessarily exact machines. And so that's you know, why they had the exemplar. So some alloy frame guns could have you know, weigh much less than 3.7 ounces in the frame, but still set off a metal detector because it you know it's, it's about magnetic permeability and then like electric the shape of it, right? Ends up being it, there, there's a word for it. It's like electrical inductance or some something, but it you know magnetic permeability is a way that you measure that. Yeah, those are all words. I totally <laughs> it's, it's it's awful words. The the two yeah. worst parts of physics is light and magnetics because it's not real. <laughs> if you can't see it, it's not true. Electrons aren't actual. Right on. So, speaking of the ATF, we've we got two things to talk about specifically with regard to the ATF. Uh, one of which is that you know individual forms like form ones and form fours have been going crazy fast. And a lot of people have been saying some really retarded shit, <laughs> like really about, retarded shit about why. Um, and just in case you're wondering, I'm, I'm a little sick and that's why I'm talking through my teeth. It's a lot more comfortable for me right now, uh, but I probably sound different from what you're used to. Uh, like John Crump, God bless him. God bless him. Uh so eForms was getting loaded, right? Because everybody was trying to register new shit. Uh, some, of how people, fast. So some people were getting two-day returns on their Form 4s. So yeah. people were like, you know, really? And it was only newly filed Form 4s too. Yeah. And there was you know, theory crafting the effect of ATF hired a bunch of new people and they're doing Forms fast, but you know, none of that's really concerned. But all that really matters for you, the viewer, is they were getting Form 4s done quick. Yeah, it was happening quick. And Form 1s. Form 4s and Form 1s yes. were happening really quick. And, uh, and like, eForms was going down because eForms can't handle it if two people log on at the same time. And so people like our friend Crump were saying that it's because they're taking... The reason they're going so fast is because they're taking eForms away. And this was based on... I believe it came to him in a dream. Yes. Uh, and then there was some other just absurd theory crafting. Um, the fact is, we don't actually know why stuff's been going so fast. I think a, a quite likely and, and rational explanation would be that this is uh, new agents coming in because, you know, these ki- things kind of get queued. They get assigned to a 
um, examiner and that examiner gets the stack. And so if there's a bunch of fresh new stacks and there's only five things in the stack, well, guess what? They're going to get looked at. Um, or it could be that the new examiners weren't taught the company policy of doing literally anything except <laughs> processing 30, the forms. 30 minutes of work a day, max. Yeah, max. Um, this could all just be one guy, right? Uh, <laughs> because the stack's always empty because he's doing his work. Anyway, but we don't know. That's the thing. The point is we don't know. Um, but it's still happening. So if you want to buy NFA stuff, it might be a good time. Um imagine being me and having been waiting on a four and four for over a year now and <laughs> i'm not bitter uh but yeah so th that was good and then also speaking of the atf we gotta cover this the, <laughs> the oh, man the gentleman who like failed desperately at taking the gun apart um you guys have seen this i don't need to i don't need to show it but he like uh he sat there trying to take this Glock apart forever and he hands it off screen. Uh, oh, here it goes. Yeah, for the, for the audio, audio listeners, hopefully you've seen this video, but yeah. this, this guy is a uh, Chris Bort, I believe his name is, yeah. and he's the director of ATFs. He, he's, he's the expert, the, the lead expert, whatever he's, he's, he's some jerk off in a suit yeah. over at ATFs, you know, firearms, you know, the firearms determination be all right. He's mm -hmm. supposed to be the guy who like he's in charge of the guys anyway, who really understand what a gun's supposed to be as far as, as far as ATF understands what that term mm -hmm. means anyway. Yeah. Uh, he, he doesn't know how to take apart a Glock, which is right. probably, probably not good. Oh, and then he couldn't yeah. get it back together either. So it wasn't yes. just like there was something wrong with this gun. It was that this guy was probably just nervous, right? He tried to trade three different Glocks. He couldn't, he couldn't get taken apart and he couldn't put the one together and he has to pass it off screen for somebody to do. And it's yeah, sort of, sort of an embarrassing failure, but the, you know, this whole, this whole video was strange where they also had Steve Dettelbach, the, the big wig director of the whole Fucking ETF shit, itself. Looking ass motherfucker right there. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he, he made like several very weird bungles in his speech where he, and of course this, this is one that I don't really care about, but he kept calling a drum mag, a clip, yeah. which was very strange. He kept saying that, uh, he kept, he kept trying to insist that pistol braces and, and stuff like he kept insisting pistol braces were supposed to be used for things that they aren't actually used for, but he wasn't like saying that they were to be shouldered. It was all sorts of like bizarre shit. This dude was saying like, it's clear that he doesn't actually understand what his agency's doing. Right. Which is shocking because you have to then wonder who's calling the shots at the ATF. And then you're left to understand it's the anti-gun groups. And it has been for some time. Right. How strange this isn't, this isn't a conspiracy theory. He's willing to go on camera for the national news and admit, I have no clue what my agency does. Yeah. But they said that this is the bad one. And look, we have a belt feed on here. Don't yes. you love that? That is nothing to do with any of the pushes that they're making, but there is just a 249 sitting there. Yeah. They, they didn't talk about the 249 at all, but, uh, whenever ATF had like their hiring seminar that you could sign up on 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 Zoom or whatever to yeah. go and watch, and all yeah. boys signed up on Zoom to sit in on the ATF's hiring seminar, yeah. they talked specifically about uh, semi-auto M2s, semi-auto 249s, semi-auto 240s, so all the belt-fed boys, as well as 50 cal anti-material rifles were extremely popular for the cartels to buy here and then bring them south of the border. And with the machine, you know, with the belt-fed guns that were semi-auto, they turned them into machine guns there right. because. You know, you know, it's a matter of modifying parts that are already there, and so it's sort of a interesting thing in in that regard. They didn't talk nearly as much about the whole cartel angle because in the past they've been big on the whole cartel, gun smuggling, gun running, the iron pipeline, gun mm -hmm. trafficking. We have to stop. They talked a lot less about that and a lot more about ghost guns and danger switches and and the Glock and the Glock full auto. And you can't you can't control a Glock. And, and it shoots really fast and you can't have that. Yeah, you gotta and, slow down. <laughs> and I mean, I'm gonna put on my tinfoil hat for just a little bit. The timing of this happening can't be a coincidence. Uh, what with it being an election year? What with Biden having failed? I, I, I guess him getting the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is something of a win on his gun control promises. Everything else he's fall, fell, fallen desperately short on. So he's going to need the ATF to be have as much public support as possible because the ATF and its rulemaking authority is the only way this dog is banning anything at this point. 
<laughs> and so far that's not going terribly well for them. So ATF sort of needing to save face and salvage some amount of reputation and make it look like Biden's totally actually going to ban him for you this time, guys. Just vote for him one more time. Vote for the skin zombie because he's going to do it. He's the one calling the shots. It's not a guy pulling the strings that lives inside of him. He hasn't been dead for six weeks. He's actually alive. And so they've, they've sort of propped it up, I think, in this manner. And ATF trotting this out, uh, they, they, they've done now, now done... Uh, very, very recently done another one of these sort of puff pieces where they're talking about, you know, with the national news about how bad switches are and how they're right. the only ones who can save us from this scourge. And they're doing a great job of it. And you can tell because of the fact that they're recovering more of them. That means that they're stopping it. <laughs> <laughs> because they keep publicizing it, right? So, that, yeah, yeah, so they're getting them all. They're getting them all. We've caught, yeah, we're, they're getting them all now for sure. That's what's happening. And I don't, I don't think that this is unrelated to the, the super safety thing. I think the closer we get to the election, the more it hurts to call them wins, but the ATF is going to you know cast them as we're winning guys. Look, Ooh, we stopped the scary gun dealers. The, all these, all these machine gun dealerizers in, in the gun community gun truck mm -hmm. that, that they go to sell at, at the street and Biden seen them do it. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's a corn pop. It's a corn bad pop dude. Three Dracos. <laughs> God, I, I, I always forget that that actually happened. That like we didn't make that up, you know? Because that sounds like the type of shit that we'd make up. Oh yeah, no. Biden says that there used to be a gun that was the truck that would pull up and just like uh, the, drop guns on the corner. The, the <laughs> Bidenism that I can't, I can't believe is actually real. Was the time that he was talking to the. It was, it was like at a community pool or something. And he said that he has hairy legs. And when he goes to the pool, he lets the kids run their fingers through the hair on his legs. And I was like, talk, what the fuck are you talking about? You could, let's say that's true, right? You could waterboard that shit out of me. You could, you could hook me up to a car battery by the nipples. I'm not, I'm not saying that shit. That's fucking weird. You couldn't waterboard that shit out of me. Oh, that's pretty good. All right. Well, guys, speaking of that, let's talk about Math Corporation. Guys, you need to be going on Math regularly and checking what's available, what's in stock, and what's in store. There's a bunch of new and wonderful products, and you can get a discount if you use promotional code FUDBUSTERS. That's F-U-D-D BUSTERS. Check it out. It's maf-arms.com. After that, we, this is one of the funnier stories this week. So you know Flint, Michigan, the place with the water. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, they uh, they had the cutest little gun ban idea, and that was that they didn't want people carrying guns in city hall, which is always such a like naked moment for governments where they're like, "No, we are scared of you." <laughs> Not right. Um, and the way they did that was they invited the court to hold you know to have proceedings in a office there and thus making city hall a court building oh, uh, and so gun rights groups sued people sued and uh the lawsuit got held up for a while but it has now survived the motion for summary dismissal and it will be proceeding Judge Brian S. Pickles, nice order this week, says he found no federal or state law that explicitly provides the city with the right to regulate the possession of pistols, other firearms, or pneumatic guns, ammunition for pistols, blah, 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 blah. Especially in connection with the attendance of a member of the public at an open meeting of a public body. With the lawsuit, which is still pending before Pickle, also seeks a permanent injunction against the council and joining it from holding meetings subject to the OMA if members of the public are excluded based on their possession of guns and other weapons the little screwdriver that's advertising me but so yeah that's that's interesting just a little thing i don't think there's much to say about it um what do you think do you have anything to say about it it's it's certainly uh an interesting strategy and you know once the supreme court totally like gets in gear and then starts like smacking the people who won't follow bruin in the head it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me if the anti-gunners resort to these sorts of strategies where like you, they they start like saying everything is a daycare and you can't have a gun there anymore because you know, sh surely whenever the Supreme Court decides on sensitive places they'll say like elementary elementary schools 
no gun, no, uh, them, them kids. No, only, only the resource cop officer. Cause he's the good guy. He can have, he can have the one, he can be the guy. He can have that gun and that you know, the anti-gunners will, will pivot to everywhere's a preschool public park. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the preschoolers go to the public park band movie theater. Sometimes the preschoolers go to the movie theater band. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think it's a you know, from a standpoint of an anti-gunner trying to do typical anti-gunner arguments. I don't think that it's actually bad. Right. <laughs> as far as insane anti-gunner arguments, it's not one of the most insane. So valid. All right, let's move up. What do we have here? Brian Brandon for Brandon Herrera. He's yeah. gonna be the senator. Yeah, this is the Texas 23rd Congressional District primary election results. Brandon Herrera uh, is didn't gonna, win. <laughs> did not win, but uh, Shikashi, uh, he didn't lose yet. So yeah, Tony Gonzalez, who we all know and love, no, no, we don't, uh, got 45.1. Texas is not a, in terms of their primaries, is not like, uh, you know, simple first past the post it, they actually do have runoffs which is much better a much smarter way to do it so it will be a second uh the second go herrera versus gonzalez uh and we will get to see what happens um so this means that we get like at least a couple months more of, of shit posting about brandon herrera's political career so, i personally i hope he wins i hope Just he wins and fun. i hope everyone has fun because <laughs> it'll be funny and everybody will have fun and uh, yeah. the, the ship posting will probably be be pretty fantastic. And that's all I have to say about that. I have a more sinister. <laughs> but anyway, I hope <laughs> I do, if he won't I, be I, finished. <laughs> yeah, I do. I hope it. I hope it. I hope he wins. I really do. Like sincerely, I hope he wins, and I hope he has fun. Me too. Uh, I hope everyone has fun. They won't, except for, except for Tony. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Fuck him. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck him. Uh, but you know who we don't fuck, but we fuck with Patriot Patch Company, guys. PatriotPatch.co is like the longest time supporter of the show, supported the show. That guy was he ran the show for a little bit. The guy who went off and did Patriot Patch, so he's a real guy. All right, so you want to go to PatriotPatch.com if you love Twig, go to Patriot Patch. So you love use promotional code Twig10, get yourself on the Patch of the Month Club. We have here. I haven't gotten to hook it up yet because I'm still getting stuff set up. But look at that. All luck, no skill. That's me. It's literally me. Uh, and you can get on that. And guys, every month when these patches come in, you just feel good. All right. I, I just got this one in. Guess what? Made me feel a little bit better. Made me feel a little bit more like I want to stay around, you know? Have a nice time. Uh, but yeah, patriotpatch.co. Use promotional code TWIG10 to get yourself a discount and let them know that you still love him and the show. It's patriotpatch.co. All right. Next up, we've got the. <laughs> I like the way you wrote this headline. <laughs> The SIG MCXR Retardorator. <laughs> this is so fucking terrible. Look at this. Finally, the gun that everybody's been asking for. I want. I I wanted this. Uh, essentially, for for the for the audio listeners, yeah. you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I guess close your ears if you're sensitive to horrible images. Uh, SIG made. Like if you're familiar with the fight light uh, SCR, the sort of like traditional rifle stocked AR derivative nonsense. Right. They've made that, but for the MCX. Yeah. It's 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 my wrist look hurts at. looking at this. It's horrible. And see, the thing is with the with a bufferless system, you can get away with a lot more. Like you're constrained to a lot less, and yet they somehow made it worse than the I- fight light. One. And they keep trying to say, oh, this is ranch rifle. Ranch, this is the ranch rifle concept. Like, once upon a time, I don't think the ranch rifle concept was bad. I think this is like such a bastardization of the ranch rifle concept where you've taken a gun that, like, I, I don't know that the MCX would ever be a, a good fulfillment of the ranch rifle right. concept but you've made it worse this is worse nothing about this is nothing about this is good or better look, than a they regular got a video of the guy's opening his little fence he's look he's got it in the truck this is so relatable well, he's, he's got he's the got john deere that he's not allowed to fix yeah he's not allowed to fix that one it's john he's deere. gonna kill the tractor he's got to put it down oh, no, he's putting the gun in the tractor yeah that's what you do with 
He's putting his gloves on to drive the tractor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now he got his special <laughs> horse pants. <laughs> it's a tractor. It's a tractor with a cabin, right? A tractor with a cabin that I'm sure is heated and cooled. And so he puts yeah. his gloves on once he gets in the tractor because you can tell he's a tough guy who works with his hands. <laughs> yeah, no, and he's always got his suppressed MCX Ranch Edition with the wrist breaker stock. This well, is one of those ads. Is... This is this is a horrible ad. I have to ask if Sig has. Oh, wait, hold on. What is what's the what's the conflict here? So it's setting up for some type of conflict. There, oh, <gasps> there's the coyote. coyote. Yeah, there's a coyote, the animal th- kind, not the you know border kind. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's every different type of self insert in a country music song is all <laughs> going to shoot the same coyote. That's what that's what's happening here, like. There's a bunch of different perspectives, and they're all gonna they're all converging on this one coyote. And I think the end of it is gonna be they all accidentally tag each other. No, okay, they all survived. <laughs> they all killed the coyote. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. So yeah, the MCX regulator redefined the ranch rifle. Uh, I'm sorry, but do you get what I'm saying? Does your wrist hurt looking at that? Yeah, that really really does not look comfortable comfortable at all. Like, like, like if you keep your thumb on the left hand side of the gun, if you're yeah. a left-handed person, if you keep if you keep your thumb that on doesn't cross over side. the stock, probably yeah. it's not going to suck as bad. Right. But no, that 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 looks like it's got the same problem as the fight light, where that that just straight up does not look comfortable or right. Yeah. And again, this they already moved the location of the trigger. Yep. Why didn't they just move it further back and have a normal comb? That's a good question. That that because then it wouldn't be a rank rifle. <laughs> it wouldn't be a rank ranch rifle. But uh, I think you and I have the the same opinion on what's an actual like really good ranch rifle. I think the Mini Thirty is a good ranch rifle. But then the problem is, is I built that. Uh, I, I guess I rebuilt. Really, it was that you know that factory Colt seven sixty by thirty nine, mm. and then especially whenever I took the scope back off of it because I you know, I had the silly. Colt 4X scope that weighs like 15 gorillion yeah. pounds, especially when I took that off of it, I was like, I think this is probably a, a better fulfillment of the ranch rifle concept, and it's got a pistol grip, and it's got all of the super salty, assaulty features, but you know, at, the, at the end of the day, those super salty, salty features don't make it not a good ranch rifle. They don't. They do make it kind of pokey when you're like lugging it around. That's true. It's, it, it's, you know, it's bigger in height form factor yeah. if you will so to me the best like of the firearms that i've taken and like you know messed around with on my property um the best were in for some reason and i couldn't tell you exactly why i'm just convinced that 762 by 39 is the round for just it's property really use. Nice. it's i think it's just perfect i think it's the exact right one um i'd have i'd have two guns that i would be like those are the ones i want to just carry around and that's the mini 30 and uh and just a regular sks yeah just regular old rinko um sks uh the sks specifically because it doesn't have a mag that's going to poke you at all uh sks is just oddly comfortable uh on the sling uh super easy to shoot easy to acquire targets with easier to shoot something that's moving compared to the mini 30 uh because it's an open site and i'm going to be real with you i think a bayonet is a useful thing and you're poking around and sometimes you find something you don't want to touch. So yeah. to me, it's like either the mini 30, because something about it just feels ranchy. Right. But the, uh, I think the SKS is probably the objective, you know, all around most useful, just property rifle. My only objection to the SKS is it's huge. Is it? It's still, it's still kind of a long rifle. I guess my standard, like, you know, my basis of a comparison is so messed up. <laughs> with, with an SKS with a 16 inch barrel, I think, I think you're, then you're there, but then that's like a very comparable firearm to the Mini 30, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, that's fair. Yeah. The SKS does have a little bit of extra length. So it's, you know, it's a trade off. You get your, uh, your, your more uh, staff like nature with the SKS, and then you get to use it as a pike, whereas the Mini 30 is, much more of a gun <laughs> but uh but yeah that's that's my uh that's my takes there so that's interesting all right last up and i know you guys would would throw a fit if we didn't talk about this but the rust trial <laughs> oh boy this was good um the, 
the gun expert they hired was like the most, and this is a term that we've invented today in our Twitter arguing, um, and, and that's I'm I'm now referring to uh, FUD boomers as revolver Americans, and uh, I think that this is the the most revolver American <laughs> shit I've ever seen. So yeah, the headline's great. Rust trial. Deputy springs into action as gun expert appears to point empty revolver at judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bailiff's like, stop, stop it. Yeah. Oh god. Now, a lot of that was a was a headline. So I I, yeah. I watched a, probably more of this trial than I should have. I guess listened to more of it than anything because uh, I was bored and wanted something to listen to, and so I I listened to it as it was unfolding. So this particular expert described himself as the premier collector of AKs in the U.S. <laughs> I don't okay. Specific, specifically Russian firearms, including AKs, I believe he said. Okay. So, okay, sure. But uh, he had two two guns he had brought in with him uh, for prop purposes, or I guess demonstration purposes. One of them was a you know, blank non-firing gun, which was the one that he pointed in the general direction of the judge. And then uh, the uh, the other one was a, a live a live firearm, but of course both were on both were unloaded. But the the trial was was really weird and i think so it was the the armor for the the movie mm-hmm. hannah guterres reed who was on on trial here i think her lawyer was really bad dude <laughs> like i've i've watched enough criminal trials of these live trial things just cuz i think it's interesting that i've seen what it looks like when you've got a really good lawyer mm-hmm. and seen what it looks like when you got a really bad lawyer and right. half the time this dude would have a witness on the stand he could not get a single question in without an objection from from right. the prosecution and every time the judge was sustaining it oh really yeah That's like so brutal. It, it was it was tough it's stacked and, like that does happen that, that is stacked yes and the you know the 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 the, the lawyer in in question uh, like the the witnesses he brought up like this expert witness wasn't really doing like 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 he, he wanted it to go into these great long stories about like why he liked certain guns or where he bought this gun and like dude dude talked for like 20 minutes about like what his expertise was and like he didn't leave a single detail out right. <laughs> and it's like like he did the, the, like the lawyer even specifically said just like could you give us the short version this dude talks for 20 minutes straight <laughs> uh there was all, all sorts of weirdness that happened uh, essentially what it came down to was uh she, she was convicted of i think it was involuntary manslaughter uh, she she was she was found guilty of the of the big thing that she was facing mm-hmm. uh, uh a lot of, be, because of the fact that she had some role in making sure that like live ammo doesn't get mixed with dummy ammo and that it right. doesn't get put in a live gun and that that live gun doesn't get handed to a poorly trained chimpanzee who will then shoot the camera person with it right now the pro- interestingly the prosecution in closing arguments i think it's odd that I, I do still think it's odd that this carried the day um i mean of I, course i wasn't there but i i agree the the totality of the evidence as more and more of it came out was like it's it was there was gross negligence on her part there's probably there's really no other way to explain it right and then the best case her lawyer could make for her was she was young on a movie set where the guy telling her what to do was Alec Baldwin, who's like not young and he's famous or whatever. Right. And that she was like, you know, afraid to speak up for safety. But the problem is, is she's on record and talked to the cops saying she understood all of the things about gun safety. It's, it's, you know, she, she really, really screwed herself over by talking to the cops. And then she talked to the cops again with her lawyer present and admitted to the fact that she didn't check the gun. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> that's not good um but yeah involve manslaughter i don't know so yeah that's that is pretty much like criminal negligence level yeah it <laughs> was it was yeah. the, the 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 more details that came out it was it was clear and like some of the stuff wasn't even contested that like really it, it was so it was like she, did, did she like i haven't been following this the same way you have did she like take part in ammunition coming on scene or were like they, like, they was never it true that they were like target shooting and shit they never 100 I, I i didn't i didn't hear anything to the effect of you know the rumors of there there was like actual like plinking that happened on set mm-hmm. i don't think that was ever sussed out but 
the the prosecution built a case around and of course it's like none of it was proven proven but the right. prosecution built a case around she was the one who brought the live ammunition to the set hmm. and not intentionally right. she just brought it as like some of her prop ammunition that she brought from her from like her previous set to this one and they said that that only speaks like further negligence because it's not like you checked at the previous set right and Nicolas cage could have been shot at that set and then you right. brought it to where alec baldwin could have shot or shot someone and so that's you know, not a good thing. And you know, they, they they did manage to trace, you know, by color of primer and construction of the bullet, they were able to say this is what all the live rounds looked like. And in closing arguments, it was it was pretty not good looking where they're able to say that like here's a live here's a live round on this day, here's the same live round on this day, here's the same live round on this day. The live round of ammunition was put back into the box of spare ammo. It was put back onto an ammo belt. I feel like you should have been checking for a hole or the rattly ball every time you picked up a bullet. But did we you know, find like, out if the other duds had holes or rattle balls? Yes, all of all of the you know, all of the prop ammo was was you know, was purchased prop ammo and because oh. of course, like putting together crappy prop ammo isn't something you're supposed to do. So mm -hmm. you know, it either had a fired primer or had a hole in the round or had a rattly ball inside of it. And they, they even specifically had, you know, prop masters speak to the fact that like stuff where you just take a fired round and then stick a new bullet in it isn't supposed to be done. It's supposed to have a rattly ball or a hole in it. And that's that's right. what the like the armorer's guild or whatever 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 nonsense it has for it is. <laughs> There's it's, a grand that's, armorer's council. That's what they <laughs> film, say is supposed to be done. Film armorer's guild. <laughs> and so and so the, the the evidence against her was was pretty not great. Uh, and I guess probably the most interesting thing is during closing arguments, the prosecution, the prosecutor lady specifically said, uh, you can find her guilty of manslaughter, even if she wasn't the only irresponsible actor. And she specifically said she wasn't the one who pulled the trigger on the gun. Somebody else took an irresponsible action for that to happen. And their, you know, their, you know, their, their trial is coming soon. <laughs> and it was like, it, it, you know, it, so it turns out this is the, this is the prosecutor who is going to be prosecuting Alec Baldwin later on. I think his trial isn't isn't until maybe it's next year. Maybe maybe it's like a summer fall time, but it's it's still quite a ways off. But right. uh, she she is the one who because I guess if you guys remember how the stupid stupid drama unfolded, uh, Baldwin was charged and then he was uncharged and then maybe he was going to be charged again and then a grand jury indicted him again. And it was this prosecutor lady who got him, I guess, indicted the second time. And so she's she seems to have a case against him regarding negligent handling, as well as the fact that he being the guy on the set, you know, he, he, he being a producer of this movie, right? He's the one who hired the incompetent lady. And they had had two prior negligent discharges on set that just went totally unaddressed mm. <laughs> <laughs> like there's two previous times that like a gun wasn't supposed to be loaded and i think in both both cases it was blanks but two previous times a gun wasn't supposed to have ammo in it and it had blanks and it went off <laughs> and just nothing changed on set it was just like oh wow that was scary so, wow, anyway <laughs> wow. all right next movie <laughs> <laughs> all right well that is that is it for today a nice long episode for you boys yeah that was a big one but juicy yes. so anyway we've got more fud blasters coming for you guys we just uploaded one on the Bruger and thomas apc9 uh bwc9 <laughs> yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> whatever yeah the bwc9 the foldy one oh, um shit, and that shit. was our favorite one yet uh not favorite gun our favorite, <laughs> favorite favorite review of a gun yeah. Our favorite review of a gun yet. Our favorite gun so far is the uh, the Phoenix HP 22. <laughs> That's the only good one so far. <laughs> so, but yeah, check that that out, guys, and stay tuned because we'll be coming at you with something new soon. So, as always, we will see you next time. Bye bye.